Hi, all. Welcome to the Riot Lunch and Learn series, the place where we spotlight Riot sponsors and partners. My name is Natalie Ballard. I'm the Events and Operations Manager for Riot. Just a couple quick reminders before we get started. This event is being recorded and will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and uploaded to the meetup page where you registered for this event. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please place them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and will read the questions aloud throughout the presentation. Questions are read aloud for those watching the presentation at a later date. Finally, please keep yourself muted throughout the event to help mitigate background noise. Today, we have a Perna Spraylick from Aurora Group and George If to me from Chemicon to discuss high power capacitors. Aperna, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Really appreciate uh, the invitation and also the opportunity to present. Uh, once again, we are presenting today on capacitors for high power application. And here is a quick look at the agenda. So we're just gonna go over the Chemicon capacitors in brief, uh, some of the design related um, problems and possible solutions, precautions, technical support tools, design and R&D trends, and the latest power products for uh, high power applications. And if we have enough time, we'll have some Q&A time as well. Just a few, moment, a few words about the Aurora Group. We're the manufacturer's representation firm for Chemicon in the Southeast, uh, specifically in North and South Carolina. And we represent Chemicon along with other components as well. We cover for the Aurora Group in the full East Coast. Our team is specifically in the Southeast. And we offer technical advice support for quality manufacturers. We guide through technical challenges and offer component supply liaison quotes, order sample and expediting. So if you have any questions about capacitors, we can certainly ask, answer them as quickly as possible for you. Here's a look at our team. You probably know some of them and probably seen a lot of their names in the past. Just wanna flash their photos on the screen. We cover all markets and all types of solutions. So if you got a question on technical components, feel free to ask us. Here's a look at our line card. And once again, today, we are highlighting United Chemicon Electrolytic Capacitor. United Chemicon Capacitors are the world leader in electrolytic capacitor manufacturing. And you're gonna hear a lot more about that. Uh, once again, a real nice shout out to all our distribution partners. These are the current distribution partners for Chemicon components and anytime you need to find them. And now I'm going to turn it over to the technical manager, uh, technical engineering manager at United Chemicon, George Iftemi. He will go into more detail on Chemicon and applications for high power capacitors. George? Oh, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I apologize for not showing my face. I'm having uh, some technical difficulties with the camera. Uh, too many monitors and not enough, uh, uh, not enough room, basically. <laughs> um, but as Aparna mentioned earlier, we are, um, I'm sure everybody knows, or almost everybody knows about, uh, about us. We are uh, um, United Chemicon, or you know, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Nippon Chemicon, which is the world's largest manufacturer of aluminum electrolytic capacitors uh, in the world. Um, we, our bread and butter, so to speak, our main products are aluminum electrolytic capacitors, along with their cousins, I guess, the polymer capacitor, and then the conductive hybrid capacitors. We also have a lineup of amorphous choke coils, which we introduced uh, maybe five years ago, four or five years ago. We make super capacitors, double layer capacitors, and we make some, uh, especially larger size ceramic capacitors and baristers. Um, another thing that we do, uh, which most customers don't know about, is we also cre uh, can uh, create models and supply mo uh, modules of, of different type of capacitors. Um, you know, this particular one is a surface mount hybrid hybrid module for a 48 volt hybrid, uh, but we can also make modules for screw capacitors, snapping capacitors, um, mix and match LC filters kind of capacitors and so on. Next, please. Um, our, you know, we are the only manufacturer in the world that are 
that's that's very vertically integrated. We make everything from the aluminum foil, for which we also have the the, the biggest market share, um, all the way to the rubber bungs, to the aluminum cans. And uh, while we do not make the paper, we actually are designing the paper and are involved with the supplier of paper to actually create the chemistry for it. Um, in general, anything that is important or critical to the long-term reliability of the capacitor, we tend to make in-house. And the main reason for that is control and consistency. Next, please. And I mentioned before, we, we have an in-house supplier of raw material. We're also the only supplier that actually mixes their own electrolyte. And electrolyte is a very high, high um, absorbs moisture very quickly, and it has a very limited shelf life. So it's very important that for most electrolyte, from the moment that it's mixed together, it has to be integrated, in, impregnated inside the capacitor and sealed uh, within 48 hours maximum. Um, so that's the main reason why we mix our own uh, electrolyte. Next. I mentioned a little bit earlier about the foil. We etch the foil, which basic, basically etching gives you capacitance and the formation gives you long, uh, it is the main factor of long-term reliability. We do supply a lot of etch foil to our competitors, primarily high voltage etch foil, um, but we um, do not supply any form foil to our competitors. Um, etching is, as I mentioned before, etching is the key to miniaturization. And, and when you're talking about formation, it's really, formation, most people discount it a little bit, but formation gives you low random failure modes in the, in, in the application in the field. And this, the both of these become very important when you are talking, especially when you're talking about high power, high temperature type applications, um, where you have a lot more stress on this oxide foil and a lot more stress on the capacitor. So you are more likely to have a, a runaway type of failure, either a runaway thermal or a, or a breakdown short type of failure. Next, please. Next. We're going to talk about this one. Sealing rubber, again, sealing rubber is important because most people think of the rubber as just a little plug that, that seals a capacitor, but it, it basically acts as a metering valve. It controls how much electrolyte vapor um, can can escape from the capacitor, and by the you know because of that, it controls life to a big extent. Um, for all you know, for all intents and purposes, if you have a failure in the seal, the capacitor will have a life measured in weeks, not years. And the aluminum can becomes important again for the high power because um, when you're talking about capacitors, and I'll mention, you know, a little bit that there, there's a few more slides after that, but, you know, power is basically heat. And, and, and the cans become, uh, to a certain extent, especially when some of the newer designs are be, become a heat sink for the capacitor. They are helping the, the capacitor dissipate heat more consistently and more efficiently. Next. Um, production facilities, cleanless is very, very, very important. Um, you know, any any speck of dust, for example, can create a problem later on down the down the line on the capacitor's life. Next. In terms of, uh, of, of we, you know, I mean, I'll go through it really quickly so we have more time for the for the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, obviously, you guys will have this presentation and you can go and peruse it. Uh, but this is kind of a little short flow chart of our uh, of our R and D system. We spend um, a large percentage of our profits on R and D. It's it, they are really important uh, for us. Next. We have a global sales network. We have a global manufacturing network. There's going to be a few more slides, but but uh, you know uh, we are a Japanese company, you know by by heart. We're founded in Japan, you know in the, in the 19, 1930s basically. Um, but we have factories. We have a factory in North Carolina. Actually, if you guys ever, if anybody wants to visit an aluminum electrolyte capacitor manufacturing facility, um, that is available if you if you need to visit it. Um, but we also have factories and sales offices in China. We have them in Indonesia, Malaysia, um, Taiwan, and of course we have several of them in uh, in Japan. 
Next. Um, this is, a, again, this information can also be available or found from the, from the website itself. Next. Uh, we strongly believe in, in BCP, business continuity. Um, in general, every component we make can be manufactured of, at at least two factories. There's some exceptions to the rule. Um, uh, the factory is in Lansing, North Carolina, by the way, uh, close to the Virginia border, all the way in the top uh, by Appalachian State. Next. Okay, so we can. Uh, so basically, there's going to be two main portions of the of the presentation. A little bit. There's some general design problems and solutions, and 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 basically how ripple current affects the capacitors, and especially when you're looking for reliability and life. Next, you know the 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 there is no well. At least we have not yet found the magic solution to the problem. And, and that is the more power you apply to, a, especially an electrolytic capacitor, the more heat you're gonna generate, the higher the heat, the higher the internal temperature. And when you, when you run the capacitor hotter, you will, you will have a shorter life. Or in the, in, in the worst case, you will have a, uh, you know, unscheduled deconstruction or a, or a random failure type of, um, type of event occurring. Next. Key, you know, we, we always talk about temperature, with, especially with aluminum and electrolytic capacitors. It's very, very important to have the correct number, especially when you calculate uh, expected life or, or circuit life. And the longer this, this, this expected life is, the more important the temperature becomes. Um, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb basically still applies every, for every 10 degree increase in ambient temperature, the life of the capacitor will have. And, and in terms of uh, ripple current, in terms of temperature itself, there is two components of it. There's an internal heat generated by ripple current, and then there is an external ambient uh, temperature. We have little control in general about the external temperature, but we can do a, you know some things about the internal temperature of the capacitor, or temperature rise of the capacitor. And, for all intents and purposes, internal heat tends to be significantly more damaging to the capacitor than external heat, especially when you have very high uh, temperature differential between the core temperature rise and then the ambient temperature. Next. Um, high power. High power is, is you know, I, I equate high power a little bit in the same trend as, uh, as computer grade, the screw capacitors used to have a while back. Um, it, it really can mean different things for different applications. Um, in general, however, when most customers ask for a quote unquote higher power capacitor, they really want the capability of the capacitor to have a higher rate of ripple current while maintaining everything else the same. Same temperature rating, same endurance, same size, same everything else. And there's a couple of different ways to that we are addressing this, this request or this. Uh, this trend from the industry. Next, uh, the uh, most obvious, and of course, and, and 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 this is perhaps the most elegant solution to it would be to decrease the ESR of the capacitor. And and there is a few ways to you know that that can be addressed. You can uh, um, have a slightly low you know lower lower resistivity electrolyte. You can have a harder paper that has uh, a little bit easier. Um, it, it, um, that, that has a lower resistivity, and they all have pluses and minuses. And you know, if if any of you guys are interested, we can have a longer discussion about that later on. I don't think there is enough time for to talk about this too much today. Um, uh, another way that we're approaching this pro this this issue is we are keeping the ESR the same, but we are increasing the temperature resistance of the materials. Um, so essentially, we're allowing for a higher internal temperature rise of the capacitor while keeping everything the same. And this is this is the most common way of, of, of dealing with this problem. You know, we have a big experience or a lot of experience in high temperature capacitors, primarily because of automotive. And we see that trend going or or or, or transcending a little bit into the snappings and screw capacitors also. Um, you know, the third way is, is um, perhaps cheating a little bit. We are just 
decreasing the endurance of the capacitor. Instead of a 5,000 hours to lose one amp of ripple current, we'll make it 3,000 hours to lose one and a half amps of ripple current. Nothing really changes except the expected life. Um, the fourth, the fifth one actually is we increase the temperature rise. You know, we, we tend to be very conservative uh, because we are a Japanese company. So there's there's typically a lot of safety margin built into the capacitor. And, and, and especially on a case by case basis, we will allow for a higher rate of ripple current on a particular capacitor if the test data that we have can support that number. We, we don't like to do it in general based on, you know, for everybody, it's a case-by-case it's -case basis. And then the last one is also something that we're starting to work. This is, you know, this is kind of 25% uh, on our side and 75% on the customer side. Um, you know, of course, heat is generated inside the capacitor and heat can has to be dissipated outside of the capacitor to, to, to keep it colder. Uh, we can do some certain things in the design. We can have an extended cathode, we can have a high can feel um, to maximize the transfer, the heat transfer between the element of the capacitor and the outside can. And then of course, the customer itself can use um, heat sinking on some kind of cooling to actually uh, make the capacitor run cooler. And by definition, extend the life of the capacitor. Next. I mentioned the temperature and, and temperature being the key. The other thing is that, that's important is which temperature you're measuring and how and when you're measuring the temperature. Uh, it is very, very important for us to, you know, and, and for you actually as, 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 a, as, a, as a customer to measure the core temperature of the capacitor if at all possible. Um, you know, there's always going to be a time delay between measuring the can of the, of the, of the capacitor or even the terminals of the capacitor. Um, what we see a lot more right now is you have cyclical applications. Again, this is common for, this has always been common for certain applications, automotive, for example, or, or even a, uh, outdoor style applications. But even for high power applications, drives and power supplies, you have a cyclical application. So um, it's important to calculate the life for every one of those conditions and actually calculate a compound life uh, at the end to make sure that everything is taken into account. And this includes uh, off states also, um, because sometimes the off states can have an effect on the life of the capacitor if the temperature during that condition is high, 45, 50 degrees Celsius. Um, extreme stress tra transient conditions, you know, very high ripple current voltage or very high ripple current, cur uh, ripple current applications or conditions may also have to be taken into account if, you know, for two reasons, one of them is, you know, we have to make sure the capacitor can survive that, that condition, um, even a one time cycle. And then the second issue is, um, is, is how often does it occur? And, and, and how often do you expect it to occur total across the life of the, or the expected life of the capacitor. You know, a simple example is you have a stress that maybe, you know, raises the temperature of the capacitor by one degree. And, you know, if it, this happens, you know, once a week or once a, once a month, it's not going to affect the life of the capacitor, even if you expect a 10 year service life. But if this stress occurs every every hour or every hour and a half, you know, once you once you start adding all the all all the seconds together, you can end up with a fairly significant number that you may want to take into account at some point. And the last, the number four mm -hmm. item on this on this page is 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 balancing. It's it's very important, especially as the banks get larger and larger and larger, to make sure that the banks the capacitors are balanced for both voltage and current. Next. Uh, voltage imbalance is is a known issue with electrolytic capacitors. Um, and when I say voltage imbalance, it, this is really something that will occur in the first perhaps minutes, few minutes of application after the capacitor is 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 put in, uh, is installed in the bank. Uh, after a few minutes, the volt, you know, the capacitor DCL will eventually get go to steady state, and we're talking about very, very small differences between the capacitors. 
Um, but it should be taken into account uh, and it should be addressed. Otherwise, you may have um, failures, um, especially startup failures. Uh, large banks should be thermally balanced. So what I mean by thermally balanced, I mean, if you have 20 capacitors in the bank, you know, the, the temperature of those capacitors should be as close to equal as possible. You know, and that's, you know, easier said than done in, 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 in many cases. But if that's not really possible, when you model the life and you calculate life, you should always use the hottest capacitor's temperature as the as, as, as the temperature, not the average. I've seen applications where you where you had almost 10 degrees difference between the core temperature of, of the coldest capacitor and the hottest capacitor in the in the, in the same bank. And also when you're talking about especially smaller banks, but even larger banks um, and very large banks with a lot of distance between the capacitors, um, perhaps you know uh, the bus bar or the conductor should be optimized to make sure that the capacitors see ripple, uh, equal ripple current on them. So they're not overloaded. Next. <laughs> I included this over here. I mean, everybody I'm pretty sure knows about this already. This is the most common life equation used for, like, for larger size electrolytic capacitors. There's a few different variations of this. And, and one thing to caution a little bit is it's very important to use the right equation for the right type of capacitor. Uh, we've, we've, I've seen cases where, you know, the, the people made mistakes and use the wrong equation, and of course you're going to get the wrong, wrong, uh, wrong number. So if you're not sure what life equation to use, you know, please always ask, and we will be glad to provide uh, the equation to you. There is a the, the website itself has has some some calculators also for such for large size capacitors. And we can also provide life equation. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? We, all, we can also provide Excel versions of these life equations where you really, all you need to do is just change some variables and the equation will calculate the life for you based on those variables. But in general, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, the life equation for electrolytic capacitors is four factors multiplied together. The first one is uh, the L0 is gonna be the red, rated life or rated endurance of the capacitor. The second factor is going to be the internal heating factor, external heating factor, and the voltage derating factor. So if you one one thing to look at very quickly you know, or, or to notice very quickly is that the internal heating factor, its maximum value will be two. So if you're looking, if you have an application condition where you need to extend the life or the expected life of the capacitor, going to a larger, higher ripple current capacitor is generally not going to be very beneficial. Um, it'll be far more efficient in general to either use a higher rated temperature capacitor or a longer endurance capacitor. Mm -hmm. um, only because those two factors are not limited to a particular maximum value. They can be, you know, there is the sky's the limit, so to speak. Basically, and then the voltage derating also is a little um, tricky to use because there is a there will be a point at which you will no longer have any benefit from having such a low uh, such a low voltage. For 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 us, for most parts, that number is eighty percent. Um, so for a you know four hundred volt capacitor, for example, you know the three hundred twenty volts will be. The minimum voltage that you can put in the in the life equation. Um, anything lower will most likely provide some kind of benefit long term. There's going to be less stress on the oxide layer, um, but from a calculation standpoint, it will not help you. Next, this is also a, a simple model of a of a compound life equation. There's a few other ones, but this is this is one way to do it. Next. Now, general capacitor design trends. We we see uh, and, and we are introducing thermally optimized designs, extended cathode primarily, and also a lot of high can fill. And the high, uh, you know, when I say high can fill, I mean the ratio between the volume of the element and the volume of the can is is higher. You know, we 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 have designs that are 97, 98 percent can fill, very little space within the, within the can. And the, the the reason for that is perhaps counterintuitive a little bit. 
uh, but it provides more consistency on the on the on the thermal transfer numbers. <laughs> so we can cal we can use that higher number when you calculate the ripple current, and therefore that that will translate into a higher rate of ripple current. Um, you know, the element is always going to be a little smaller and and can move around a little bit in there. The second reason is uh, vibration resistance is improved also to a um, a little bit if we have that. Higher heat resistance materials, uh, we you know we have um, we are starting to use you know the uh, materials that are that were typically used even a few years ago in when 125 degrees C capacitors, but we're using them in 105 degrees C high high ripple current designs. We have high rated temperatures also being introduced. Um, you know we have a snap in being uh, that's already available, and we're going to have a screw capacitor uh, very soon. We are starting to introduce the frequency optimized design. Generally speaking, all snap-ins, all screw capacitors have a 120 Hertz degree, I mean, Hertz uh, frequency rating. And that's really, it's, it's designed to operate in that frequency range. We are introducing, especially for snap-ins, uh, higher frequency designs. They're not gonna be any better at 120 Hertz, for example, but they will behave better and they'll have a lower ESR and higher ripple current at 50 kilohertz, 60 kilohertz, and so on. We have, of course, longer endurance ratings of the capacitor up to 10,000 hours. And, and that trend comes mostly because the ambient temperature or a lot of these applications is increasing, but the customer's life expectation is not decreasing. So we have to increase the, the L0 factor in the life equation to compensate for that. Vibration resistance designs are becoming more common, of course. Um, you know, a lot of it is automotive, you know, snap-ins are becoming more and more common in automotive applications, are more charged and so on. But also for uh, industrial applications, we see a lot more vibration requests or vibration resistant requests. Um, miniaturization, of course, is always going to be there and it's not, you know, everybody wants the capacitors to be smaller, of course, less expensive and better. And we see a trend in the rated voltage increasing. You know, five years ago, we had just a handful of customers using or requesting 500 volt capacitors. Now it's uh, over a quarter of our of our our demand, especially for larger snap-ins and screw capacitors, is 500 volts and 550 volts, and we see that increasing uh, rapidly. Uh, we can offer up to 750 volts for screw capacitors and up to 650 volts on snap-ins, but um, there's not that much request for that, not, not that much demand for that, not yet at least. Next. Um, technical support tools. And, and a lot of these are also available on the website. You do have to register on the website and there'll be a few slides in, uh, coming up next. Um, but nobody will send you any, you know, we are not gonna send you any spam basically, even if you register. NCC just wants a record of who does what essentially. Um, we can offer thermocouple samples for almost any capacitor um, that we manufacture. And it goes back to the calculated life and, and, uh, and, and expected life and temperature uh, conditions. You know, all, all you basically need, all we need to know is the type of thermocouple you would like, obviously the, 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 the part number and the length of the wire. And we can provide the, the samples for you. My recommendation will always be when you calculate, especially on a new design, um, it's it, it it does not hurt to have thermocouple samples to measure the actual core temperature of the capacitor. We can provide spice models, of course, and, and the spice models for us are always based on actual data. Um, sometimes we have the, the data available and we can provide the model within a couple of days. And sometimes we have to actually build the capacitors in order to take the measurements to generate a spice model. Uh, we can also do thermal modeling, um, you know, for a single capacitor, or we can do it for a for a module if we if we need to. We can do three D models, and those are, I mean, we see a big request and you know increase in requests from the customer. I mean, my personal opinion, three D models for electrolytic capacitors is simple. It's just a basically a cylinder. <laughs> But, uh, but we can provide it if needed. Um, there was a question earlier about the test data and we can provide, we generally, there's two different kinds of data we can provide. One of them is series reliability data. And that shows, that's 
that's generally for three or four part numbers from a series. And it shows you the trend on how the capacitor degrades over time and, uh, and, and, and what you expect to see after a thousand hours, two thousand hours and so on. Um, gives you an idea of, of actual degradation versus what the spec degradation is. Um, and then we can also provide individual data for a particular capacitor. You can measure ESR over frequency, for example, or ESR over temperature and so on. Um, and again, some of those data is available currently and some of them will actually have to measure it. Uh, we have lifetime estimation tools again, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, if, if you're not sure, please ask, basically. We don't want to uh, run into a condition where we use the wrong life equation or 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 um, or, or, or some an error happened. Basically, we are we know we'll always we love to double check your calculations if you if you want us to. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a USA based engineering sales support. Uh, we are based in um, basically Chicago. Most of our engineering is based in Chicago. We also have a big warehouse in uh, um, LA. The, uh, Southern California area. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a factory in uh, North Carolina that makes um, large snapping and screw size capacitors. Next. Mm -hmm. I mentioned about the website, you know, and, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but this is essentially what I mentioned a little bit before. It's, that's what's available. And, and some of them are, you know, once you register one time, you can download all this data and, and there's going to be no, uh, I mean, we, ex, you know, we want you as a customer to, to, to actually ask the questions. We're not going to come and, and, and bother you after the fact, at least I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Next. Oops. Oh, these are flipping through pretty fast. I don't know why. Yeah. Any, questions I get before I start talking about the products and some of the newest products that we have introduced, especially on the high high current or high ripple. So far, no more new questions. Okay. So we're going to continue on. So, um, I mean, I'll, obviously we, we make a lot more product than, than what you're going to see next. This is just the latest products that are particularly suited for high power applications. Um, next. So on the on, on the hybrid capacitor, this is this is our, our current lineup, but the newer series we just introduced is HXF series. If you go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and to give you an idea of, 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 of the HXF, so we you know we're talking about a 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter size, a very, very small capacitor that can handle four and a half amps of ripple current. You know, you would need a, in, in, assuming you could make a snapping, you would need a snapping that's five times or six times larger to get the same type of ripple current. Mm -hmm. So this is the advantage of the, of the, of the, of the hybrid capacitor. And, you know, and the polymer itself, will, you know, a true polymer will have a ripple current even higher than that. But the polymer's main disadvantage is humidity or poor humidity resistance. And so we, you know, um, that's why you typically do not see too many polymers, especially high voltage polymers being used in outdoor style applications. They will, um, they will tend to have a very short life. Um, one other thing about the, the hybrids, you know, you see because the target application and the most common application is out, uh, automotive applications, um, you will see a lot more um, high temperature type of designs. You know, to, to give you an idea, we do make some 105 degrees C temperature, rated temperature hybrids. 90% of our sales is 125 degrees C and 135 degrees C hybrids. We have just a handful of 105 degrees C customers and they're all consumer electronics, basically. Next. Um, we also have, you know, and, and you see that a lot of surface mounts, especially with automotive, but even industrial, high, um, high vibration uh, designs. You know, and this one, you know, this the main advantage of, of this vibration is that it makes it simpler to use the capacitor on the board in high vibration applications. You no longer need to apply epoxy to the capacitor. You no longer need to pot the board to prevent the capacitor from, from, from failing 
all you have to do is basically just use a slightly wider pads on the board and, and use a high vibration design. Next. For the surface mount, liquid surface mount uh, part, the only part I'm really gonna talk about, I mean, obviously we have a lot of high temperature application parts, but we introduced a 150 degree C capacitor in, in, in electrolytic uh, application, MXB series. And this is a true 150 degree C um, capacitor. And I mentioned earlier about high temperature materials. That, that what you'll see is a couple of years down the road, you'll see the materials used in MXB uh, be used in snap-ins, maybe 105, maybe 125 degrees C radius snap-ins. And the advantage or, you know, and this, this is made possible partly because of our, our vertical integration. We, you know, we, it's, we can use, we are free, we developed all these materials, we are free to use them, you know, across a product lineup. Um, but but the main reason again, you, there's different ways to use this material. You can have a capacitor with a quote unquote relatively low ripple current, low power, at very high temperature, or you can use the same materials to to design and develop a lower temperature, lower rate of temperature with a significantly higher ripple current or power rating. Next, this is some of the ripple current, which is this this is actually not. You know, it's pretty good ripple current at 150 degrees Celsius. One and a half amps of ripple current at 150 degrees Celsius is, is very good. Next. Radial type. Again, it's this is mostly about high temperature, high power. Um, next. The only series I'm really going to talk about is the GBD series and the GPD, which is a coated can design. And this is a high vibration, the double curl design that, that we have. And we can offer similar designs like this for uh, snap-ins and screw capacitors also for high vibration. Next. Next. Yeah. And we have a 150 degree C uh, radial version of, the, of that uh, surface mount part also. Yeah. So we have 20 minutes left. So- uh, yeah, I'm almost done with that. So okay. next. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So on the snapping again. Uh, next, this is a this you know this is just a little lineup. But you see the miniaturization that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, and that's that's, that's going to keep on going. There is no again no no magic bullet so to speak to this. But things are getting better and better and better. Uh, we do have a newer foil that we introduced in the KAG series that gives you uh, you know fifteen percent or so more capacitance density. And that foil is being slowly uh, rolled across the, pro the longer longer endurance products uh, also. Next. Next. The new series that, that we talked a little bit earlier is the KJ series. This is a high power um, type of capacitor. A previous, please. Oh, gosh. I think it's a, it has auto. I, it shouldn't be. <laughs> it's on manual. It just keeps advancing. So, so that's uh, one, one, one prior to that, please. So, KJ series is 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 a very high. This this particular design uses a different electrolyte, different paper, and that's one of the new products that that has taken advantage of the new materials to have a higher ripple current. And you can see from the KMS series. It's you know it's it's basically fifty percent higher ripple current to to the, to the new part, and this is while maintaining the same capacitance and the same size. Hmm. Next, I mentioned GXA. This is one hundred and twenty five degree C uh, snapping capacitor. Uh, this is a uh, next. This is a new. Um, um, we call it the high vibration thermally stable design. This one uses a thicker bottom can and a smaller size safety vent. One thing that happens with, with especially snappings, which are basically sealed, they don't diffuse very well. And what happens as the capacitor is being used, the top of the capacitor will bow a little bit. And this is this is excessive. You know, we're generally speaking about one, one and a half millimeters of top type of bowing. But two things will happen. One of them is mechanically, the element can start moving around and fail. The second um, issue that will happen is 
you are going to lose thermal transfer capability on the on the on the element. It's no longer making contact with the top of the capacitor, to the top of the can. It's actually there's a gap now all, uh, all of a sudden. So the end result will be a higher temperature rise in the capacitor. Um, with the new style vent, you that's you know you're always going to have that contact contact between the element and the can. So you're going to have a much more stable and consistent uh, thermal transfer number throughout the life of the capacitor. Next. Next. Uh, you can go. These are some of the Lansing, North Carolina, larger power, larger power. You can go through this real quickly. Okay. On the screw caps that we have. Next. Um, this is a product lineup. You can go to the next one. I, I, I'm only going to talk about three three series. One of them is the RAJ, the high voltage uh, capacitor up to 650 volts. That were that we uh, that we introduced. Next. Next one is going to be the UTOR, and the UTOR is not a new product. It's just the perfect product for a for a very high power application. It has the highest rate of ripple current available and it is very well suited for liquid cooling type applications. The post can be mounted, can be bolted to a liquid cooled heatsink, and uh, essentially almost the only limitation on the current capability of the capacitor is the terminals itself. Next. So where, where are these used, George? Uh, usually in drive, we have a lot of mining application that are using it. Um, you know, it's it's especially if you have sealed sealed application, hazardous type applications where the the drive itself or the power is power supply itself has to be completely sealed from the ambient temperature uh, ambient. Mm -hmm. So you cannot really use air cooling for those type of applications. You have to use some kind of external mounted liquid cooling. Mm -hmm. Next. 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 This is up temperature. Next. Next. So uh, next one is, uh, and, and I, I guess maybe we can stop if you like to. These are some, these are the choke coils, high power choke coils that we have. Uh, we have introduced. Um, they basically go along with uh, with the capacitors. Um, we have uh, nano crystalline alloy, and we have some amorphous alloys also. Uh, so basically, you get a same current in a smaller package. Next. This is not really capacitor related, but next. And these are some of the, the, the banks that we can provide. Yeah. And, and, and the banks, this particular banks on the left side are super capacitors, DL capacitors, but we can also make ba uh, banks for uh, electrolytic capacitors if needed also. And the advantage of these banks is that they are self-balanced. So, you know, if you have a bank that's, you know, the capacitor on the left is probably rated seven and a half volts. You, you know, if the if if you want to use ten of them in series to make seventy five volts, um, you do not need to balance to provide anything except mechanical connection between the banks. Each bank is already self balanced, and uh, no additional support is needed on 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 the customer side. Good. So we're pretty much at the end of the presentation and the technical session. Does anybody have any last minute questions they would want to get answered? Anything we wanna review, any other details? I don't see a whole lot of questions in the chat box, but feel free to put them in. And any last things uh, you wanna mention about uh, capacitors for high power applications? George. I don't think I have anything. Okay. Oh, so question came in. Uh, do you have capacitor, capacitor line intended for temporary energy storage? Well, th th I guess the- def def Define temporary. temporary. <laughs> this is a question. <laughs> I mean, we, we do have, I mean, generally speaking, you, you, we do have supercapacitors, ultra capacitors. Yes, we do have that. Um, we have a full, I, you know, I, 
didn't really include too much in this uh, in this presentation here, um, but our supercapacitors are we make small radial size. I mean, by small I mean 16 millimeters, 18 millimeters diameter, and then we also make screw size capacitors, and we will introduce some snapping capacitors soon. And voltage goes from most the most common one is 2.5 volts, but we can also offer 2.7 and 2.8 volts. Okay. There's some information on the website. Uh, if you have a particular request, please let us know. Yeah, feel free to reach out to us anytime and we can um, certainly help uh, field a lot of those questions and help you out. Uh, the website is full of tools and just a quick study on the tools will help you uh, find what you need very, very quickly. So just reach out to us anytime. In, any other questions on the topic or capacitors in general? All right. Well, you must have done a great job, George. Nobody has yeah. questions. <laughs> you did that or a terrible job. <laughs> no, um, I'm, I'm sure you did. You did a great job. Thank you so much. And if there are no more any questions, uh, then we'll turn it back over to Natalie. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Aparna and George. Um, as a reminder, Riot hosts Lunch and Learns weekly on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern time. You can find a list of our Lunch and Learns on Meetup where you registered for this event. This event was recorded and will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and the Meetup page where you registered for this event. Thank you all for joining today. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Yeah. And I also wanted to mention um, anybody who registered will get a copy of the slides. So make sure you got your registration in. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.